And uh, here we are again for those who have stayed over from the previous panel. I'm Colin Wallace. I'm the Executive Director of Kantara and uh, welcoming you here today. So what we're going to do here is um, just let's just... Oh, I am forgetting that I am. <laughs> right, well, I've got the... You've turned the other one off. So. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Right, so, uh, well, actually, for those who are not... Uh, who weren't in the room for the earlier session, we do have um, a major announcement tonight uh, at the Solutions Theatre. So when you go downstairs for the welcome reception, uh, that's, um, we go into the expo area just behind where you, um, where you registered. That's where you'll find all the, the exhibitions, uh, the stands from the vendors and so on. You're actually going to be looking for the Solutions Theatre. That's towards the right-hand side. If you go down towards the right-hand side, uh, you're going to find uh, the Solutions Theatre. And we're gathering it there around about 6 o'clock. Uh, the band is going to be playing, and in one of their breaks, we're going to, uh, to, to take that moment to uh, make a little piece of history. So looking forward to that. Right, so that was the, that's the, the brief agenda of our hour. Uh, it's actually, it actually looks like we may have to change the order of that somewhat. Um, I think, because uh, for a number of reasons. One is that we have uh, some of our folks are, are pushed straight into the, uh, into the next session, so we're needing to try and move them through earlier than we otherwise would have, and uh, we've, still got some, uh, we've still got one particular presentation uh, that's still got to be loaded. So with that in mind, we might have to change this order. I'll see how we are in 15 minutes or so. But that's uh, generally what we're going to do, uh, take us through the hour. Um, can I ask, as we sort of kind of go to here, um, how many members of Kantara in the room or non-member participants? So about, that's about 50% of you, 50%, yeah? <laughs> yeah, or so. Yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are, Logan. <laughs> So, um, so from that perspective, that's great to know. I mean, typically, uh, when we were doing uh, the similar type of presentation in, in Europe in Munich uh, last month, we had around about um, uh, around about 30% were members, but uh, and and participants. So, majority were new. When I did the same presentation a week later uh, in Helsinki. Uh, and this was with um, a Kantara member, uh, UB Secure, uh, along with their partners, Nixu, always Kantara members, also Kantara members. In fact, it was 90%. So it was amazing how even within Europe, you've actually got a, 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 a sort of movement of awareness. So look, around 50% is, is pretty good. So for those who weren't at the, uh, at the previous presentation, a, a quick snapshot of Kantara. So it's an international nonprofit founded. Uh, it's in the U.S., but it's been going since 2009. Um, and in fact, in the last few days, it's uh, created another organisation. The, the uh, you'll hear about this, the Kantara Initiative Educational Foundation. You'll hear a little bit more about this uh, this tonight. Uh, and uh, we also have the nonprofit. Uh, based in Estonia, it's a completely separate company, uh, and that's uh, very deliberate reasons for that, but I would like to perhaps just point them out. One was because we got Brexit, and we were originally going to set up our European HQ in the UK, um, so that wasn't such, uh, when, when the Brexit vote went through, we decided to, to move, uh, to change that idea and move to mainland Europe. And the second reason was that, uh, you know, we, we were concerned about how, um, what the future of personal data would be in the US, actually, if you think of some of the pre-election rhetoric that was going on at the time. And so what we felt was it was better to actually have a, um, a completely separate company. So if we needed to, we could actually shift the, the, the data, the member data, and all the personal data actually and sit it in Estonia rather than have it in the US as it is today. So we have that nice uh, backstop option if things go in a direction. Um, we have strong societal ethics um, 
uh, around uh, a strong ethos, and uh, we're an ethics-based organization, which means that uh, we have very low barriers to entry, low barriers to participation. People can join uh, Kantara uh, work groups and participate without, without paying anything. Ultimately, we need money but, uh, to, to make the organization survive, but it's not a, a critical point. And the reason for that is that actually when you look at um, industry consortia, and most of them will say they're non-profit, but non-profit doesn't mean to say that uh, that means that everyone can just show up, because most of them don't. Nearly all of them don't. Um, Kantara is almost unique in trying to run this business model, difficult as it is, to allow folks with new ideas and no money to be able to, to bring them somewhere and share them with other people um, and try and give them traction, and that's what we do. And that's what the board, um, with its larger member membership fees, as you can appreciate, that's effectively what they're paying for. They have to buy into this, into this deal as well. Um, and there's some advantages for, for board members as well, because they get a first look at new ideas that otherwise just don't get you know, off, uh, off social media, frankly. They don't get any further than that. Um, so our mission there is written the global consortium improving trustworthy use of identity personal data through innovation, standardization, and good practice. And we like to think that we do it day in, day out, week in, week out. And you're going to hear a little bit about that when we talk about the rhythm of Kantari. You're going to hear about some of the work going on in the work groups. Our business model, membership, specification, develop, we, these are the things that we do. We, we, we uh, drive membership. We, we, we develop specifications uh, to have them set to go into ISO and other W3C, IETF, uh, different, different other standard setting organizations. We also operate our own trust framework, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. We've got a specific presentation on that. And those are the folks that um, we generally uh, work together with. We're a community of uh, organizations, individuals, and government agencies. Um, so from that perspective, just looking at our leadership and liaisons, I just want to mention some of them are obvious, and you'll see actually with the Karen Alliance, I just want to uh, point out that the Karen Alliance is, we, we, this is just a snapshot of our, of our uh, liaisons, but that one, uh, just to point you to tomorrow afternoon, I think it's something like 4.30, you'll see uh, the Karen Alliance is doing a presentation on identity in the healthcare sector. <laughs> Catherine Shulton is <laughs> in the back. Just uh, stand up, will you, Catherine? And so that's right. So look, follow Catherine tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> okay. Um, so with that respect, I just want to uh, take you briefly through Kantara's membership. Uh, so it's around 80 plus, 90 uh, heading in that direction, uh, with many, many, 10 times that number uh, working through uh, non-member, the non-member participants working in work groups and uh, looking at, on our mailing list and uh, our work groups and discussion groups, discussions. So from that sense, um, we really come to our core work. And what we, we use this mantra of uh, nurture, develop, and operate uh, because we nurture those new ideas coming through um, and we develop them into something. Not always, because you know there are a number of times when, when a new idea, a new thing, just can't get traction for whatever reason. There doesn't seem to be any perceived demand for it. Um, so we just let it go, but we know we've tried. Um, but other things you know, that, that have traction, have interest, we develop them through specifications, good practice, and uh, some of those, not all of them, but some of them end up in an operational sense. They end up in our trust framework operations where we're, we're doing third party or, or, or first party self-attesting, uh, conformity assessment on those, uh, on those specifications, on that best practice, and uh, granting a trust mark for it. So that's primarily that kind of, this is really the, the essence of what Kantara does as a community, nurture, develop, and operate. Um, it's been quite successful at doing that over the years. Uh, we, you're going to hear next, probably, from uh, Eve Mailer, the chair of the uh, UMA Working Group, because um, uh, UMA has been incredibly successful over, the, uh, over its very short period, and I've got a couple more slides on that. Uh, consent receipt specification, you're going to hear on that as well from the Consent and Information Sharing Work Group. That's that round sort of uh, glass, uh, glasses-like uh, logo there where you're going to hear uh, from Mark Lazar, uh, joined by Andrew Hughes, 
about the new plans for the consent receipt. You can imagine with GDPR coming along how, how popular uh, and interested people became in uh, consent receipt user managed access as well because of course those things are, are uh, where, where you have to have uh, the user in the flow. There are actually very few enterprise um, operations that actually have user direction and uh, um, particularly in delegated access and so on. And our trust frameworks, well, we've been running the trust frameworks for a while, accredited assessors, uh, approved credential service providers or component identity providers or com platform providers of some description. Uh, and um, we're doing that with uh, NIST, originally with NIST 863 version 2, now with 63.3. And uh, one, another, we're going to be joined by another scheme very soon now. Uh, so those are the kind of reasons where, where folks join and gather around in Kantara. That sort of kind of, it's, it's a really, it's a community feel about what, what goes on there. We, we feel like we're, you know, we're not blessed with cash, but we're blessed with enthusiasm. We're blessed with, with uh, fantastic subject matter expertise. And those are the things that we, uh, that basically we try and drive through, through the organization. And uh, I'm going to show you a few slides here about the value, the pearls there, the value of uh, Kantara's um, uh, assets. So I know this is really small, but I, and, and I'm not expecting you to read it, but actually this is off Identiverse's own blog. And the reason why I was trying to sort of try to uh, bring it there, because in different places, in fact, this was Phil Windley, those of you who know Phil from uh, one of the organizers of the Internet Identity Workshop, also uh, Phil was... Um, uh, you know, he's uh, heavily involved in the Sovereign Foundation. Uh, it's a, a blockchain community that uh, Kantara has some, some uh, relationship with. Um, and, uh, and it was Phil who actually uh, pointed out here the information sharing work group, uh, which is the sort of the, about the middle there under GDPR and the work that's been done in the consent receipt. And he's also mentioned user managed access uh, further down as well, because he saw those as critical five trends to watch in 2018. And he wasn't alone, because these guys in Europe, Kup and Jacol, said exactly the same thing towards the other. It was actually, you'll see the date on that, is the 1st of December 2017. So they were actually already starting to look, and very top left, UMA and consent receipts. So uh, it doesn't matter uh, which part of the world you're in, you're having to, you're getting the sense that people feel that these two things are pretty critical. Um, here in UMA again, this, this is actually taken from Origo. I, it's once again very small, but it actually says, um, as I've screenshotted this, UK could lead the world with pensions dashboard architecture. Um, and actually it's from an organization called Origo uh, in the UK. It's a, it's a financial services nonprofit that basically brings together banks, insurance companies, pension organizations um, together. And uh, the UK is building this sort of kind of, because you amass a number of pensions over time, um, it's, a, it's really hard to keep track of them. So basically, the UK government is inspired to build this pensions dashboard, which is a great idea, except that uh, people will say it's actually impossible to do. And Origo have gone and proved by using UMA that you can actually do this. And uh, that's actually what it says, the very first bullet. Combining digital identity, APIs, uh, and UMA paves the way for a solution without parallel. Um, and at the moment, we have um, in Europe with uh, PSD2, uh, the Payment Services Directive 2, we have a number of banks who are saying uh, that basically the, the, the regulation is impossible to, to comply with because there isn't any technology um, or standards and specifications that does it, but that's actually quite incorrect. So a, a few highlights there um, of what we did last year, 20 events, and this was one of them last year. Um, we weren't here in Boston, we were in Chicago. Uh, it's, uh, it's looking like as we go into 2018, it may even be more than that. So that's, the, that's how it's looking there. Um, we have the announcement tonight, and we have uh, lots of new work and consent receipt, uh, the insurance program, in fact, all of these things. Um, and uh, some interesting ones here with the R&D program. We, we uh, run an R&D program in the US uh, with uh, DHS, Department of Homeland Security Funding, 
Uh, and in fact, one of the first ones actually was lockstep from Australia, the mobile device attribute verification. Uh, DHS not being, politically, uh, not being parochial when it comes to uh, R&D dollars because they just simply want to get the best, uh, the best stuff in the world. Exponent is a US company uh, and they're doing mobile mo to mobile to mobile authentication. Those, uh, those are R&D projects that have been spun through Kantara. Uh, so we're project managing uh, the, the direction of those. And uh, we certainly in Europe, uh, we are currently in line for, we have, we're in three uh, Horizon 2020 funding bids. And pretty much all the time people are, um, we're, we're typically asked to, to join consortia um, bidding for these things because of two things, the trust mark and trust framework and the ability to run that, uh, and our development platform, working groups, discussion groups, publishing. We have, a, we have all the tools necessary, otherwise these guys have to recreate it. So with that, I want to um, follow up pretty quickly with uh, Eve, because nurture and develop, that's it. Nurture, develop, operate, that's what we do. Uh, major announcement, as I've just said. Eve, can I welcome you up here, and we will move, move uh, consent receipts and user-managed access around. Uh, so at the back, we need another deck. We need the one, the UMA, PowerPoint, if we could. Thanks, Colin. Uh, and when we've got that, uh, are you on? I think he's just working on finding your deck. Worst comes the worst years. He's just distracted, I think. Yeah, I know. Did you put that in? Yeah. Just try to find it. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Any questions, actually, while we uh, while we continue on here? Just getting. Some, yeah, that's it. Any questions? We'll have to wait. Right. Okay. Why don't you, know you just hold, you hold yep. you hold on to that while I go and see if I can find the right. All right. Um, I can start talking while we wait for visuals. Alex will be inspired by you. You're so good at it. I'll tell you a little bit more about. Um, Uma, I can paint word pictures. I'll just hold this. Um, I have no idea where he put it. So uh, Colin was describing a little bit about Uma and the use case uh, from Origo, a little bit more about that. So there's a number of use cases that have been coming to light. Um, and maybe what I'll first do before diving into use cases is just encourage you all to come to the Privacy 2.0 session, which will start at 4 p.m. in room 311, which three of us who work on Kantara um, efforts will be talking about uh, those efforts in some detail. And you can imagine what Privacy 2.0 might mean, and we'll go into detail about that. Sal and Mark, who I don't know where he's sitting now, and I, uh, all of whom are uh, in leadership positions in Kantara work groups. I will be talking about that. So user-managed access is one of those. There's Mark. Um, it is one of those. And in brief, I just wanted to describe um, this use case because it's so evocative. Um, some of us may be working on or have heard of open banking. Colin mentioned PSD2, which is its cousin, uh, Payment Services Directive, second version. Um, there's kind of a follow-on use case which has been uh, subject to its own mandate in the UK called um, Pensions Dashboard Project. So um, those of us in the US know that we tend to hop from job to job. And in the UK, they found that um, the average person has uh, 11 jobs in their lifetime, and they tend to leave behind their pensions, um, private pensions, and don't always collect that money and know where, where it is when they go. So it's sort of equivalent to US 401ks. 
So this mandate is to make it easier to aggregate a view of that information, all that money, and then be able to do something with it. Wouldn't that be nice if we had that here? <laughs> I think to myself. Um, and so Origo is a, is a company that uh, works with pension account companies all across the UK and is working to provide a solution for exactly this pensions dashboard and they're using UMA to do it. So it's quite an exciting use case for not only the aggregated view of all of your money, but to share that information, you've got it up, wonderful, thank you, to share that information selectively with, um, uh, with financial advisors and financial planners and that sort of thing. So that gives you a flavor of what user managed access is for. So now that we have slides, uh, hopefully that gives you a grounding in what UMA is all about. So I don't, well, I'm not gonna, no, maybe, maybe I will do the quick explainer, I don't know. Um, actually, I'm gonna sort of skip the, the detailed explainer. Maybe I'll save the detailed explainer for the end if Colin says that I have time. <laughs> um, so let me go through a timeline of what UMA has been about. So UMA was the very first work group of the Kentara Initiative when it was formed, kentarainitiative.org. Um, so uh, we did a lot of work assiduously to build a version 1.0 of our protocol, which is built on OAuth. Who here is familiar with OAuth? I'm gonna guess pretty much everybody, yay. My peeps. Um, and we came out with a version 1.0 that was ratified in March of 2015. And uh, less than a year later, we had a version 1.0.1 which I thought of as a patch release. We use semantic versioning in UMA, uh, as is proper. And then we went through a kind of a version 2.0 based on experience that we had through people implementing it and using it and adding use cases to it. And sort of fast forward, and we basically had a, um, a, a substantially complete version within about a year and a half, as you do. Um, but then with various ratification measures, uh, January of 2018 is when we finished a version 2.0, which is a much closer based on OAuth version than I think 1.0 was, uh, to encourage adoption to um, be more useful to IoT use cases. It was useful, I think you could say it was agnostic as to IoT, but now it's more useful directly to IoT use cases, to be more secure, um, and to um, be more applicable to wider ecosystems. Uh, meaning, uh, not just client ecosystems, but I'll get more into the details of how you can more loosely couple all of your services on the server side. Plus, we have a nice new logo, which you can see in big form, in the lower right, um, thanks to one of our number. So I talked about this pensions dashboard use case. Um, if you look at some of the work of the um, ACE group in IETF, you see that some of their uh, early use case documents are built on an assumption of sharing from a resource owner, OAuth language, which UMA uses, with a requesting party. OAuth does not have a requesting party. This is UMA language, in fact, which they got from actually work that I contributed to ACE. So this is when you share, when Alice shares access, if, if anybody um, stayed for a little while in, in Justin's uh, OAuth masterclass, you learn that OAuth is a delegation protocol and authorization can flow over that delegation protocol. Well, in most OAuth grants, you're delegating access to an application that you yourself use. In UMA, we call this Alice to Alice sharing because you're using the app. What UMA enables is Alice to Bob sharing. That's what the requesting party is. So if you look at the ACE actors document, you'll see that requesting party, which is quite interesting. Smart devices have these use cases all over the place. That requesting party doesn't have to be a Bob, by the way. It can be a Bob Co. It can be a marketing organization and so on. Finally, healthcare. Many, many use cases for healthcare. Just a quick mention, um, the Heart Group at OpenID Foundation, Health Relationship Trust, um, has been profiling OAuth, OpenID Connect, and UMA for patient-directed health data exchange, and there's a new open MedReady framework exactly for healthcare IoT use cases. Um, 
I'm, I know this has been nicknamed the spaghetti diagram. I didn't come up with that, but it's obvious why it's called the spaghetti diagram. UMA is not just about technology. There's a, a thing called the BLT sandwich. Um, BLT sandwich is business, legal, and technical. Kantara is all about trust frameworks as well as uh, technology and protocols. This is a business model that is intended to enable the understanding of when you have parties, people, who need to delegate access to other people in the context of legal contracts, agreements. For example, you might have a data subject who by law, maybe they're a newborn baby, has a legal guardian working on their behalf as a resource owner. There's no tokens flowing there. There's no messages flowing there. There's just law or contract. UMA's business model accounts for this. And this is where identity relationship management, which is additional work that you'll hear a bit more about, especially if you come to Privacy 2.0 next, um, will come into play. So we're doing all this work as we speak. Um, it'll continue in the future. There's much more good stuff coming. And I don't have time for the breakdown, so much more to come, including an UMA2 masterclass on Wednesday. Thanks for your time. I'm just gonna get, you can turn off these slides now. This just illustrates what's so cool about UMA. And I'll just, uh, the slides will be available for you. Uh, there's a question, so as we're ch changing back to other slides, I can take the question. Thanks. Yes. Yes. I had the very first POC that my company did with our UMA implementation, and I don't know if you noticed in the timeline there were, there's three current implementations by vendors and a fourth coming, um, was with the New Zealand government, in fact. And so government to citizen is one of the, the four top use cases. So financial, healthcare, IOT, which is sort of horizontal, and government to citizen. Absolutely. Okay, so I, hello, hello, hello. That one's not on. Can you turn it off? He's, he's about to. He's turning, oh, cool, he's turning it on. Okay, so I get to, after listening to your guys' presentations, just spurn off with a question. There may be some more from the audience, but um, we're now halfway through 2018. We have some vendors who are adopting UMA. So can you two look into a crystal ball and tell us what's coming up over the foreseeable future, however long you see that. What's, what's next for UMA? What are we coming up with the rest of the year and beyond? Sure. Um, so I sell D'Agostino, uh, open consent and ID machines, a uh, long time humanitarian. Uh, long time humanitarian. Um, I, well, Eves talks a lot about this, but I happen to have the same background. But the whole intelligent transportation world and what's happening with, with connected vehicles um, really d just begging for user managed access, right? So you, and, and really what that is is an example of these very distributed, almost disconnected use cases, right, in terms of uh, very long leashes and being completely untethered. And when you get into those kinds of environments, old old school access control and old school identity and access management really does have to give way to user managed access and identity relationship management because you just don't have an ability to, um, to, 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 to do a home run to find out whether or not you're allowed to do something when things are happening like they do in, in a connected car example. Um, and so I, I you yeah. know, I, I mean, I have some work along these lines. Eve seems to have some work along these lines. So given the fact that it's popping up in multiple places, Alan, I think that that's a, that's a pretty reasonable one. And then there are, and, and, and that's indicative of uh, any of these uh, sort of uh, widely distributed and nearly, I mean, what I've referred to as kind of like nearly offline, right? Because effectively they're yeah. offline at runtime. Yeah, and I'll just add to that quickly. And if 
I don't mean to be obnoxious, but maybe make a, pl a plug for another talk I'm doing on Wednesday called <laughs> Don't Pave Privacy Cow Paths, which is about kind of the new mobility connected car. Sal's been working in this area forever. And I'll just mention, I, I think we are gonna get Mark up here if you do finish your thing in time. Awesome. Because um, the combination, we haven't talked about like GDPR, but the combination of UMA and the notion of relationship management and consent receipts is so awesome um, in context when you get into IoT, which Alex talked about in the, in the previous half hour, which I was, I was tweeting about, you know, as if it were food and wine pairings, you know, talk pairings, um, <laughs> right? Everybody should be tweeting about their favorite talk pairings. Um, so I don't know if you were gonna go there next with a question, but. Yeah, I mean, and I, I, th I, you know, and I think that that's kind of an interesting precursor to people also realizing how um, you know, in a machine learning or, or AI world, uh, UMA also has a lot of advantages because, you know, they I mean, talk about the ultimate delegation um, and, the, and the need for, um, yeah, in cases where Alice isn't there, you know, the, the, you know, the heavy, heavy metal Alice might be. Um, <laughs> or no time to click I agree. I mean, just let's, we have to stop thinking sure. about opt-in. It drives me nuts that all the regulators are obsessed with this notion. I'll talk about it more in my Wednesday talk, but anyway. One of the problems that I notice that keeps coming up is that uh, UMA is great for, for of, of course, user consent, but it's almost a binary consent. You either give consent to all your data and you get through, or you don't give consent and the company generally will block you. Now, is there, is there, uh, maybe I haven't seen this, but what, what, what types of, of, of plans you have for gray areas where you give consent to certain attributes and other attributes uh, are not shown or blocked or even anonymized on purpose? Actually, haha! -ha, I'm glad you asked. You're making me plug in a, another talk. Um, no, in fact, so UMA is predicated on what I call scope-grained access, just like OAuth, except that you're able to be proactive about granting it, so it's like Google Docs only standardized. Um, the resource server has the authority to design the API the way they want, which means designing the scopes the way they want. Just like with any other OAuth grant, um, UMA takes the scopes it gets from the resource server. But this time, Alice gets to say ahead of time or well after the fact, I decide to grant you those scopes or not. So it's not all or nothing for certain. If you wanna get finer than scope grained, I'm actually talking with some people who have come to me and said, how do I get finer than scope grained? And that's you know, what people call dynamic scopes in the open banking context, and there's things you could do. Okay. Yeah, I Think mean, and, I mean, and, yeah, and, yeah, 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 quickly, just one area in which the relationship management work very specifically is that people are taking relationships and you know in a graph database t taking that constellation of relationships and attribute groups and then using that to do things which are pretty fine grained at the end of the day yeah <laughs> we'll talk about ai applied to this and we're about to switch to the consent receipt initial presentation yes well hello everyone Welcome to the Cantera intro, uh, the ABCs of Cantera. It's great, we just got, just got into Boston, and um, it's what a great city. Wow, it's pretty nice here, I'm not sure. Is everybody here from Boston? Yep. No? Just a couple? No one's here? So, wow. It's, good. it's a good opportunity to meet people and, and to come. Anyway, so here I am. Uh, my name is Mark Lazar. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Open Consent. And let's see if this works. There we go. Closer. All right. So, um, Open Consent's a Cantera liaison organization. So we have a formal arrangement to work with um, Cantera, and we do a lot of work on. We've done a lot of work in Cantera. So, do I, do I have my notes anywhere, or they, should I just grab my computer? I got. I mean, I could talk to. I could probably figure it out, but. Uh,
right. So yes, so for this work group, the Consent Information Sharing Work Group, it actually was once called the Information Sharing Work Group when it first started out. Uh, the work group um, started, I think, in 2009 uh, with uh, Joe Andrew and Ian Henderson, who were the chairs, and I was the secretary uh, when it first got going. And this is just after Cantera moved from being Liberty Alliance and came into, um, started up as, as Cantera. And Liberty Alliance was really attractive to me because uh, I was really, you know, I'm more on the social side. And the, this work group was set up to work on the people side of the identity infrastructure, which was pretty much non-existent, uh, especially around information sharing. So, um, uh, and one of the reasons to join is because we could join and explore new things and bring up new projects like uh, user, um, user-driven terms, user terms, uh, infrastructure for for people to be able to have more control um, of their data or be more a part of the data um, and identity infrastructure. So, um, yeah, the first project actually out of the work group was called the Information Sharing Label, which got, um, which was pretty good. How much time do I have? Five minutes, all right, so I'll, I'll jump through. <laughs> uh, so we've had, yeah, we've had a lot of good projects. Uh, currently there's the um, user managed uh, terms which is with, uh, I'm not sure if anybody knows Doc Searles and Customer Commons, uh, but they have had a role um, in our work group, which is, which is great. Um, and um, of course, Mary Hodder, uh, who's in IDSG and has done a lot of work in the work group. Um, so the consent receipt work actually started uh, back in 2012. There is a W3C submission, um, do not track and beyond, uh, where the work really started focusing on uh, all the things that were broken with consent and notice online, um, why it didn't really work for people. And as of, uh, as of May 25th, we've, we now have version 1.1 actually published. So the work's come, uh, it's taken a long time because uh, we had to figure a lot of stuff out before consent was actually um, popular or defined by the EU uh, in great detail. So let's skip that slide. Um, so one of, the, one of the things I spent a lot of time looking at was why privacy policy didn't really work and what, why, what would work. Um, and, you know, privacy policies are definitely uh, important, like why do we actually have them? And society ultimately is based on consent, so if you vote in a country, yeah, you know, there's a consent-based uh, framework in that country. I think 126 countries have privacy laws. Um, and. Uh, when they provide a privacy policy, a notice provides transparency, and that usually would be used to legitimize practices of, of different organizations. But privacy policies are not for people. In fact, they're a tool of self-regulation. So a company gets in trouble, a regulator can look at their privacy policy and say, you know, you've broken your own policy and, and give a fine. So that's normally how privacy policies work. Um, but they don't really work as a privacy notice for people. Um, and I'm going to skip that last point for this one. So most privacy policies, what you'll find is they have something like this clause, which is pretty much a contract clause put into a privacy policy that says when a policy changes, you can check back here. If you're not comfortable with this, stop, stop using our product. Um, so this is where we started figuring out, well, how do we solve this problem uh, and get past privacy policies? So we came up with the idea of a consent receipt. Uh, and actually, a receipt turns out to be a really old piece of technology. It's the first form of actual writing that's been found. Someone was sending goods somewhere far away, and um, they wrote down what was the goods were so that the person receiving them they would know what they received. So it captured the state of what was being transferred. So when we looked across all the jurisdictions with the privacy, different privacy frameworks, it was pretty clear that the most common elements were notice and consent. Um, and you couldn't, you can actually have consent without notice. Uh, so we ended up building a consent receipt specification which captured all the required fields to legally and to capture the state of uh, consent and privacy. And when we work those up in the UX, um, there's four, four categories for people. So consent type, purpose, sharing, and treatment. And this is really useful. Um, because we, we lined this up with the ISO 29100 framework uh, and the ISO 29184. 
So we can see that um, it's machine readable and usable with international standards. So underneath all of that, uh, we have a field called consent types, which really simplifies things for people. Uh, there's four general consent types that we're working on right now uh, for the consent type field and the consent receipt. Um, and people really understand these four types. So you can break explicit consent and implied consent down. Um, well, all the privacy signals are down to these four types for people. Um, and I think most significantly is people can take a consent receipt and they can go back to that privacy policy and can I go back? Yeah, they can go back to the privacy policy and uh, basically see what the status of their consent is without having to read it. So there's the big in innovation. Uh, and that's pretty much the consent receipt in a nutshell. And the, bu the button's broken, so. Well, we've got a lot of work to do for the version uh, two. Um, we're definitely making the consent receipt for the GDPR. Uh, it's got a few extensions in different fields. We're mapping the international privacy rights language with the GDPR. Uh, and we also have um, some really exciting stuff with the data categories, personal data categories. So standardizing those so that those can be used at scale. So that, that's a that's the exciting stuff. So if anybody wants to come in and learn more about that or get involved, please do. Well, yeah, so this summer we definitely have interoperability. We're, we're leading up to the My Data Conference uh, in Helsinki, where a bunch of companies from the work group are getting together to, uh, well, basically trade around consent receipts and show how a consent dashboard will work uh, for people. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, also, I think with different environments, um, different types of consent and different implementations. I mean, we have a lot of implementations going on now, so it, it's quite an exciting time. Uh, I think we're the only consent standard there is right now being implemented. Um, so it's uh, pretty cool. And, you know, uh, definitely working with UMA and IRM and the other work groups is uh, something we're looking forward to this year. So, thanks. Great. Thank you, Mark. That's great. Uh, and our last presentation for the day is from Andrew Hughes. I'll let him introduce himself, and he is uh, uh, going to present on the on Kantara's Trust Framework Program. So this is our flagship. And uh, over to you, Andrew. Thank you. Okay. Um, so another exciting presentation. Uh, if you were in the other room. Uh, with my previous presentation today, uh, we were talking about exciting ISO standards. This is even more exciting than ISO standards. Okay, who agrees with this slide? Standardized authentication and credential management are critical. Has your opinion changed over the last five years? 10 years? Yeah? It was kind of got to log in, it's a hassle and everything. So. We all know now with breaches, the, the, the most common way in is through compromises on either authentication or credential management. They get in as administrator, steal the database, and start cracking passwords. Okay. Fortunately, there, are, there is standards work going on to elevate the level of practice in authentication and credential management. Uh, you will know about the FIDO standards uh, for passwordless authentication. Well, in the US, National Institute of Standards and Technology has developed with a very broad community, um, 863.3, which is Digital Identity Guidelines. Now, when you look at standards, it's all fine and well to say that you follow standards. But um, what if you had to prove it? What if you actually had to demonstrate that your organization conforms to the standards as written, 
has conformed and will conform into the future. Is it good enough just to make the claim? Well, if you're running an ICO, it certainly is, but we're not. So what Cantera Initiative has at its, as its flagship program is we have trust marks for credential providers that do authentication and credential management. Uh, these are quite simply logos, but to qualify to license the trust mark from Cantera, um, there's a rigorous program of assessment, validation, continuous evaluation um, against a well-known standard like 863.3. And in fact, if you can see that tiny print there, you'll notice that the sorry, left side ones, uh, they're specifically for conformity to 863 version 3. Cantera is the first organization to have an actual approval program and trust mark for 863 version 3. So if you'd like to get certified for that, come talk to us if you think authentication and credential management are important for your customers. Who else, who wants to know about what you do inside the business? Does anyone here sell anything to anyone else? I, get, I have one hand, come on. Look, it's not eight o'clock at night. I can, you know, work with me here. One of the very common uses for um, trust marks is purchasers make having certain trust marks and certain certifications a prerequisite, a table stakes minimum requirement to bid on projects. Uh, most of you will be aware of um, ISO 27001, Information Security Management Systems. Uh, 27001 is a very, very common certification requirement. For example, I'm from Canada. Uh, Canadian federal government, basically if you're not certified for 27001, don't even start looking for procurement. It's just required. It's expected. So, I'll recap here a little bit. If you think authentication and credential management is important, if you sell things to anybody, IT services or products, uh, if you'd like proof that your marketing is true as opposed to made up, trust marks are useful. And I did that accidentally, but it worked quite well. Let's go forward. Okay, so we don't certify ISO standards, but you can tell by the colors that these are the these are four very large SaaS providers. On their compliance pages, they they have dozens of conformance certifications, because before they did all this, the customers' auditors would request access to come and audit them directly, and you can imagine if you are one of these very large SaaS providers, that is not actually possible for an external auditor that doesn't know your scope of business to audit you. It's pointless. Imagine if you're a medium-sized SaaS provider or IT service provider. Um, you probably have a compliance officer that works full-time with customer requests to come and audit you, second-party audits, right, before they'll buy from you. That's the power of certification. You can shortcut that by using a well-known standard, a very well-operated certification program, and trust marks. So, we have uh, Kentara-approved credential providers. Uh, you may be familiar with some of them. Um, okay. So what's a trust mark? Well, it's, it's a logo, it's a graphic. The power of the trust mark is the program integrity and quality behind it. So how are assessors qualified? What is the quality of the service assessment criteria? Is the program itself monitored? Are the results monitored? Do they, do the, does the program follow standards itself? Very important. Cantera accredits assessors to perform assessments using our service assessment criteria. Um, we have a few, we have them listed here. And also we harmonize um, there's harmonization processes going on right now 
between, as I mentioned, the NIST 863.3 standard and ISO standards for entity authentication. So it's a step in the forward direction uh, towards international standardization. So uh, I'm borrowing one of Colin's slides here. Um, Kantera develops trust marks and certification programs for standards. Uh, our, our, we have a flight path for additional schemes that we're developing, um, including, somewhere down the road, uh, an approval program for consent receipts and consent management. Uh, two of our work groups right now are developing the requirements and specifications around consent receipt, which Mark, Mark uh, talked about, and also the practices of management of user consent to collect data for processing. And that is that. 